the road to Damascus. Somewhere along here, Saul was blinded by the light. He had a vision of God. And at that moment, he became Paul the Apostle, the man who spread Christianity to the Gentiles. Well, Prophet Mohammed, Zoroaster, even Joseph Smith, they all had visions too. Now, I'm fascinated by these moments of insight, not just by the what glimpses they might offer of God and heaven, but also because these visions inspire change. They give birth to new ways of understanding God, even starting entirely new religions. How do visions change life here on Earth? I'm setting out to explore the power of divine visions. In this first photo, you're in a wheelchair, and now you're standing, you're walking. Now see how visions can turn a life upside down. I just reached up and touched the wall, and the wall was alive. I'll step into a space designed to bring on divine visitation. Learn how facing down spirits uh, is just coming apart at the seams out there. Can bring one man back from the brink. And discover how a message from God. I said, yes, Lord, I will do it. Can save more than 10,000 lives. Come to southwestern France to visit one of the holiest sites in Catholicism, the sanctuary of Our Lady of Lourdes. Many Catholics believe this grotto is where, in 1858, a poor 14 year old girl named Bernadette Subaru had several divine visions. Father Xavier Daroud is a Franciscan priest who grew up nearby. Uh, trust me. And this is? So this is the grotto of Massabiel, and that's where it all happened in 1858. Right here. Right here. Bernadette was just coming to get wood for the fireplace. and suddenly she sees the apparition. She's scared. She thinks that uh, she's a ghost. She tries to make the sign of the cross, but she's afraid. Bernadette didn't find out until later that her vision matched depictions of the Virgin Mary. The lady starts doing the sign of the cross and says, I am the Immaculate Conception. Bernadette was shaken, but she was sure of what she saw. She goes home and she says to her parents, I saw a lady at the grotto. And the parents say, And the parents say, but you're crazy. I, and we forbid you to, to come back here to the grotto. Now, father, why would they say that to the child? Because they were the lowest in the town, and so they didn't want to create scandal. The parents say, just shut up. Why didn't she shut up? Because the urge was so present. She had in her heart that call for coming back. Bernadette disobeyed her parents. In fact, she returned to the grotto another 17 times. She was asked to do penance for sinners, not, for, not herself, for herself, but for the sake of the people and for the sake of the whole world. According to the legend, 
In one vision, the Virgin told Bernadette to dig for water in the grotto and to drink it. She dug with her hands, but only found muddy water. She drank it anyway. Villagers gathered, wondering if she'd gone mad. They don't understand what's happening because they cannot hear the discussion. They just see the reaction of Saint Bernadette. They I'm watching that, I'm saying, what? What in the world is she doing? Exactly. But soon, the water started to run clear. And the villagers had a change of heart. They took it as a sign that Bernadette was indeed directed by the Virgin Mary. On the following day, Lady, who was in a neighboring village, had an arm problem. Paralyzed or? Yeah, and so she came and put her arm in the spring and got cured. There was no internet, no television, but the word spread quickly that something very unusual was happening. Were a lot of people healed? And many people have been healed here. In the decades after Bernadette's visions, three sanctuaries were built on top of the grotto. Today, millions of people make the pilgrimage here to bathe in and drink from the spring's water. Father Xavier introduces me to a nun who claims that she too was cured by the healing waters at Lourdes. Her name is also Bernadette. Sister Bernadette, I mean, uh, may I introduce Sir you? Bernadette. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Morgan. Morgan. Oui, oui, je suis enchantée. Je dis bonjour. Bonjour, ma soeur. <laughs> she was officially recognized as um, being cured. Why? Cured of what? Vous avez été guérie de, de quelle maladie, alors? De syndrome de la queue de cheval, qui me paralysait progressivement. She had to wear... Um, Brace? Yeah braces, and she could walk. Sister Bernadette's illness had no medical cure, so her doctor suggested she make a pilgrimage to Lourdes. Et j'ai prié pour les malades qui étaient à côté de moi pour qu'ils guérissent. Mais moi, j'ai jamais demandé la guérison. Donc j'ai terminé la prière et je suis retournée dans ma chambre. Et là, j'ai une voix qui m'a dit « Enlève tes appareils ». Et puis j'ai enlevé le corset. J'avais plus de douleur. Et, Et le lendemain, j'ai marché 5 km. <laughs> ah oui, j'ai des photos. S'il vous plaît. In this first photo, I see you're, you're in a wheelchair. And in the second one, you're apparently pushing a wheelchair. And you don't look much older. That's 2008 and yeah. 2009. One year. Yeah. Doctors could find no medical explanation for her recovery. Sister Bernadette believes it was a miracle. The Catholic Church agreed. In 2018, they recognized her healing as one of only 70 official miracles at Lourdes. So miracles are not that prevalent. They're rare in the church. We're not looking for miracles. What is important for me is that indeed it's a holy place. Our Lady appeared here. St. Bernadette's vision of the Virgin Mary lives on in the waters of the grotto, the basilica, this entire place. Catholics believe that what happened here was a miracle. And even if you don't believe, you have to accept the power of her vision. It has created a place that has transformed many lives, like Sister Bernadette's, many thousands more. But does the divine only appear to the deeply devoted? Or is it possible to see God 
even if you doubt God exists. I've come to London to meet writer and editor Ian Ball. Ian had a series of epileptic seizures, which led to a profound change in his outlook on life. Hi. Yeah, nice to meet you, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about your seizures. How did they start? It started really in January 2010. One evening, I was at my local pool having a swim when everything turned sepia colored. The next thing I know, it's two days later and I'm waking up in a hospital after two days of epileptic seizures. It turned out I had a tumor, um, what they call a chondroblastoma tumor of the bone and bone tumor yeah it was a bone tumor that was becoming a brain tumor and that was what was causing the epilepsy and i had neurosurgery to have it removed you had the surgery it was yeah. removed yeah and it was after the surgery after i'd left the intensive care unit that um, i started to have what i call breakfast meetings with the universe <laughs> clever breakfast meetings with the universe. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit? <laughs> the first morning, I remember, it started with the sunrise. Uh, sunlight came into my room and woke me up. And I remember just looking at the wall above my bed, which was the same as it always was, except now it really felt like a miracle. The fact that there was sunlight? It was the, the wall itself presence of the wall. wall. I just reached up and touched the wall, and I remember feeling like the wall was alive, like it was conscious. Everything Ian thought he knew about reality was cast aside. He had begun to see the world in an entirely new way. Ian Ball had never been a religious person. He never really thought about God. But scarring from brain surgery brought on a series of visions that made him question everything. This carried on for about three or four weeks. About and how often? Every day. Every, every day? Every morning. I felt like I was being sort of transported and being revealed fundamental truths about the nature of reality. One of which is that all inanimate objects are conscious. All beings are conscious, including walls, tables and chairs. Which seemed very counterintuitive to me. I mean, who, you know, how can you have consciousness without a brain? The other thing that seemed to be happening was that everything is bound together in one thing by an endless, unconditional love. And there was this huge wave of emotion that came with this experience, which was really powerful and uplifting. Are you religious? I was an agnostic. I didn't know how to understand it. I don't know if it was God. You don't know that it wasn't. I don't know that it wasn't. I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Ian wanted to find out whether his visions had a medical cause. So he joined the Cambridge University study conducted by Dr. Joseph Tennant. It was searching for a connection between epilepsy and mystical experiences. That's a scan of the tumor that was the cause of the seizures okay. I was having. So, I mean, as you can see on the scan, the growth from the skull with the left temporal lobe, and so this is pushing up against Ian's brain. And so they had to cut all that section away, but obviously when you do that, you leave a bit of scarring on the left temporal lobe. So it seems something about the temporal lobe is potentially capable of producing spiritual experiences. You have not come to any sort of conclusions yet on it. We can't induce a seizure on someone of a mystical nature and hope that we can get a good scan of it under an MRI. We don't know when these seizures are happening. No, can't you come to some sort of conclusion behind that? Uh, not, not quite. I would. Yet. I, I would mean, jump right to it. Well, so, God exists. <laughs> uh, Joan of Arc, St. Bernadette. 
Do you think that there is a possibility that they experienced this sort of epilepsy? It is possible. So there was a neurological paper that speculated that Paul's vision on the road to Damascus was epilepsy. But I mean, so what? Because the thing that occurred afterwards was Paul was moved to go preach and become you know, St. Paul. <laughs> right. As a scientist, I can't tell you whether these are metaphysical or not. So the thing we can look at is to say that something in the brain is capable of producing religious experience and can do so even when it's not intending to. All right, here's the $64 question. How has it changed you? Well, I think, you know, it did remove any sense of that I had that the universe is a meaningless, cold place. I think it gave a kind of foundation of meaning for me. And I think this idea of was it a revelation or was it just a, an aberration in the brain? I've come to the conclusion it doesn't really matter because the thing that really sticks with me is that feeling of uh, endless, unconditional love. And I don't think that really matters where it came from a divine force or from my damaged brain. It was a real feeling, and for me, that's, you know, yeah. that's, that's inspiration enough. Just trying to live in that spirit is enough. Very good. It's easy to get caught up pitting science against religion the rational versus the spiritual. But Ian's case shows that there is room for scientific understanding without discounting subjective feelings of the divine. As Carl Sagan once said, the notion that science and spirituality are mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. Visions can reshape our personal relationship to the universe, but changes don't just happen inside those who receive divine messages. They can shape the lives of thousands. Sociologist Andreas Schneider has come to rural Kenya to meet a man who changed the world. Dr. Charles Mooley is a prominent businessman and philanthropist, but he didn't have an easy start in life. I grew up in a rural area far away from the city of Nairobi. At the age of six years, my father, my mom, they abandoned me. At the age of six, suddenly being by yourself, yeah. I, I, I cannot imagine that. At the age of 16 years, I decided to walk to the city of Nairobi. And I, I had no experience, I had no education, but I got a job. And uh, I got some money, uh, I bought a vehicle, and later I was able to buy another one. Then I had a fleet of buses. His bus fleet grew into a successful transportation conglomerate and he became a wealthy man. But his newfound success was about to suffer a profound blow. In 1986, Charles was confronted by some poor boys on the street in Nairobi. They wanted money. I said, no, what have you done? You have done nothing, and I will never give you money. It was a decision he would come to regret. The boys stole his car. But Charles' feeling about those boys soon shifted from anger to sympathy. I had no peace in my heart because I did not give this young uh, food. I had already forgotten about my past, that wow. I was like them. The faces of those boys haunted Charles for years. Until one day, his guilt became too much to bear. In November 17, 1989, it was around 11 o'clock in the morning. I felt uh, like uh, the world was falling apart. There was no peace. I was crying, you know. I was asking God, what is that you want me to do? And there was a lot of fear in my heart. 
and back and four hours in that car. Four hours, four hours crying the voice of the Lord God is sure to me. I gave you everything. I raised you from nowhere and I gave you all this. And now I want to take everything that you have, give it to the poor. I went down to the humblest level. That was the real turning point. They said, yes, Lord, I will do it. And that the moment I got the greatest joy in my heart. Yes. This is actually something that we see as a breakdown that brought on a new beginning. I told my family, I have a good news for you. And I said, I will not work any time for money. I want to give everything that I have for the poor. Hearing God speak to him gave Charles the courage to start an orphanage. But this proved to be another test of faith. He found a large plot of land capable of housing many children. But it was useless without one vital resource, water. We had um, a severe drought. We had no water anywhere. We had the three wells and that we never got water. I was praying for three weeks. It was after midnight that during that time is when I heard the voice. Your problems are over. Get up. I'll show you where I'll give you water. And so my wife and we walked all the way. And then we stood here. And God said, this is the place. I'm going to give you water. And then I told my wife, call the children. And then the following day, then we started to dig. We had to trust God. That must have been a, a, a gigantic relief when you finally found the water. I've never seen something like that. I've never felt in my life something that was so touching. All the people from the village, all the children from Muli children family were in jubilation. The water from that well helped the Muli children's family become an operation that today almost funds itself through farming. Since Charles heard the voice of God on the side of a road, he has built six orphanages and raised more than 10,000 orphans. He has rescued 10 failing schools and built many more shelters for children. There was nothing better in my own life that I could do than saving children's lives in the world. That's quite a privilege. Yeah. Uh -huh. Charles was willing to give up everything he had for the sake of his vision, for the sake of God. And in doing so, he changed thousands of lives. How many of us would have done that? For the faithful, visions of God are a source of divinity here on earth. They bring miracles, unconditional love, and endless compassion. Visions, however, are rare. But what if divine guidance was available on demand? I've come back to France, home to some of the world's most inspiring architecture.
But one of his most important works is not in the City of Light, but in a small town 50 miles outside Paris. Chartres. Since its completion in the early 13th century, Chartres Cathedral has drawn a never-ending stream of pilgrims. Its design is said to inspire them to feel the presence of God. I want to know how. So I'm meeting Dr. Julio Bermudez. Welcome to Chartres. Thank you. A professor of architecture who studies sacred spaces. We're going to enter to a sacred space right. and allow you to prepare. How do I do that? Well, we're going to walk into the threshold, looking down into the floor. And then once we get in, close your eyes. Close. Take a breath and look up as you open your eyes. This was built by hand. I mean, no, no machines. No, no machines. machines. Manpower. Every stone cut. An act of love and commitment to God. A project of this scale was a colossal undertaking in the pre-industrial age, which makes it even more remarkable that Chartres was mostly complete by 1220, just 26 years after construction began. Back at the time, of uh, the 12th, 13th century. This was just an amazing thing. It was the biggest thing ever built. Imagine you being a pilgrim that had walked for several miles and see the highest, biggest, most incredible church in Europe. Pilgrims eight centuries ago would likely never have set foot in a space this tall. First thing about the Gothic is verticality. Uh huh. The eye goes up, and this is about 120 feet high vaults. To the ceiling. To the ceiling, okay. yes. But what you have to think, these people really felt that they were conducted to God, to heaven. And when pilgrims looked up, they would experience another key element of this sacred space. Light. Light, perhaps the most important thing. It represented God. So God spoke through light. And that's why when they have these stainless windows with those beautiful icons, they believe that God was talking to them, telling the stories of the Bible. When you encounter a place that overwhelms your senses, absorbs your attention completely outward, and demands so much brain power, and that allows you to enter in a state of uh, unity. So an actual physical change takes place in the human mind when it walks into a place like this. Yes. It's a mystical state, if you wish. Or a state of grace. A st absolute state of grace, correct. See, I'm catching on. <laughs> but the people who built Chantre Cathedral nearly 800 years ago meant for it to be more than a passive experience of space and light. It was built so that pilgrims could make a physical journey all the way to God. Look at that. It's a labyrinth, maybe the most famous labyrinth in the world. Something that allows you to enter in a contemplative state. Meditation. Yes. Morgan, why don't you try it? I'm game. Bizarre. You're doing very well. Mm -hmm. And you can't go too fast, otherwise you lose your way. Every time it feels like you're going farther and farther from, let's say, the truth or the center, and yet, 
you're getting closer in, in a different way. And ta-da. Morgan, you made it. There is something to this. But I feel something was at work. Yes, it's very interesting. You accomplish something and you have an experience. Yes. I had an experience. In the middle of this incredible space. The designers of this cathedral created a magnificent space. In there, you feel a connection to something bigger than yourself. There are generations of history connected there, not to mention their Herculean efforts of the people who built it. It's more than that. For me, it creates a sacred space up here. Stops logic, stops the persistent drumbeat of modern life. It transports you outside of time. I guess you can call that divine. in the mountains of Ethiopia, Orthodox monks take a different path to the divine. The Tigray region is famous for its mountain churches, many built more than a thousand years ago by Ethiopian Coptic Christians. Carved directly into the mountain, the ancient houses of worship often tower thousands of feet above the ground. The climb up to them can be extremely dangerous. One false step can mean the end of a priest's earthly journey. But many of them make the perilous trek every day. U.S.-based Ethiopian journalist Femnet Yamaskan has come here to try and understand why. He's meeting Dr. Hagos Abra, a scholar of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Dr. Hagos. Hi, hi. Good morning. How are you? So tell me where we are. I'm, I'm looking at a, a structure up there. And what are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, this is Christian Orthodox Monastery called Abba Yohani Monastery. Why is it so far up there? Why not build a church that's slightly lower and more accessible? I have been asking the same question for many priests and monks, uh, and most of the time the answer is simply because they are getting closer to God. So the burning question for me is, can we walk up and be closer to God? We have to first call the monks and then ask a permission to walking up. He's a monk of this monastery, so he goes up and down this mountain every day. Yeah, he says minimum once a day. He prays frequently and uh, he meditates in the cave. So do you think he can take us now? They embark on a strenuous climb to a lofty chapel, and perhaps to experience the presence of God. Oh my goodness. The climb to the Abba Yohane Monastery in Ethiopia's Garalda Mountains is not for the faint of heart but its remote location has allowed it to resist invaders and looters for at least 1,600 years. Wow. 
Wow. Oh my goodness. That thing. Wow, this space is beautiful. What is the monk doing? He's praying uh, the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms is uh, the most respected prayer book of Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Far removed from the noise of the modern world, the monks who make the climb find a mystical refuge, a space to pray in peace and lose themselves in contemplation of the divine. It's really amazing to, to be in this space and, and to just really experience the, the peacefulness and just the special place that this is. I have to say, at first, I didn't know why anybody would want to build a church or a monastery so far up and so far removed from everything. But now that I'm up here, I understand why they would do this, because the peace and the tranquility up here. Now we can say that we are where God dwells. Every day, Orthodox monks of Ethiopia make long, dangerous treks up rugged mountains to be closer to God's home in heaven. Along the way, they sense the presence of God in silence, stillness, for them, it's not the destination, it's the journey. The tradition of actively seeking divine guidance is not only a Christian one. I've come to the Mississauga First Nation community of Stugard Lake in Ontario, Canada. I'm here to learn about the Anishinaabe First Nations practice of vision questing. Here to welcome me is Eddie Robinson. Wayne Bojo. Wayne Bojo. Wayne Bojo. And Wayne Bojo means I see your light. Yes, and I'm going to learn from you, and you can learn from me, and I'm going to respect you, and you can respect me. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I want to know about a vision quest. How do you decide to go on one? And what are you seeking when you do? One of the main things is it's for us as human beings to re-engage with our original family, our first family, and that's creation. But it's also giving up food and water, giving up of those basic essential needs and physiological needs for creation. So we go and spend time on the land in a singular spot and just pray. And while we're there, we engage and interact with energy, with spirits and animals. They know that we're there to pray, to show our gratitude. So it's a way to get back in touch with the Great Spirit. Yes, yes, right. yes. So how did you happen to go on the vision quest? Um, a calling an unexplainable calling inside that tugs at you. Like a lot of indigenous people in Canada, I lived in poverty, living on the margin. Uh, it was after being in juvenile detention and on the streets that uh, I was actually doing community service hours at one of the local centers in Toronto, and I heard the drum. And that heartbeat of that drum, boom, 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 just called me. And I just started crying. And all I kept thinking was that this is my culture. This is who I am. Eddie met an Anishinaabe elder from Minnesota who advised him to head to the woods, undertake a fast, and seek the spiritual guidance of a vision quest. It was at the end of October. It was minus one. <laughs> they drove me out on an ATV 10 miles into the forest. And they put me in my fasting spot and said, we'll see you in three days, and just left me there. Uh, but in 
no shelter. No. <laughs> Come on. They said, if you get cold, make a fire. I'm like, okay. And they said, if you see any spirits, just put some tobacco down. I said, okay. And they left. Alone in the freezing woods, Eddie steeled himself for his quest. His life was about to take a new path. Eddie Robinson, a young man of Anishinaabe descent, was barely connected with his nation's spiritual tradition. But now he was on a vision quest on a freezing night miles from help. So you're on your vision quest here at Dreamwood Rock? And it was tough as I was sitting up on a scaffold probably about six feet off the ground. They're not built for comfort because you're supposed to stay awake for three days. So we put your stuff up there in your bundle and you just pray while you're sitting up there. Did you see anything while you were out there? Yeah. There was a spirit bear that came and visited me. Came, sat not even four feet in front of me. Tobacco. He's coming for his tobacco. And then he just disappeared. He must have ran 60 kilometers an hour. It was surreal to me. And you didn't eat for two days? Three. I didn't eat anything or drink anything for three days. I was crying, yelling, singing. I was just coming apart at the seams out there. I was battling and proving myself to those spirits. But you didn't die. No, it was tough. It was hard. But the hardest thing I had to do out there was face myself. I wasn't sure if it was my imagination or if it was just seeing things because I didn't have food or water. But sure enough, there was this old man that presented himself to me. And I could see him as clear as day. He was just there looking at me. And then he was gone. And that was your vision? That was my vision. Kind of like um, how I interpreted it later was that the spirits or the old ones are waiting for me. They're waiting for me to take that path. You took that path? I did. That's the path you took that, yeah. that was a better path than you were on before. Yeah, and Sort of like Saul on the road to Damascus, huh? Yeah. That's where I found my calling. Eddie's vision quest was his key to escaping a life of addiction and violence in Western culture. It was an experience he knew he had to share with other young First Nations people. So then you became a sort of a guru, teacher. Yeah. I learned about how the sweat is done. I learned about how the fast is done. I learned how to help with healing and doctoring ceremonies for our people. And all I wanted to do was just keep giving it back. Keep giving it back, right? So now that's your quest. For a lot of people on this nation, they have been disconnected from that way. So I'm here to help support them on their journey back. They've never been in a sweat, and they've never been to a vision quest. We need to reconnect our spirit to this land. We consider creation our first family. There were so many people that want to sit with our first family. Like Saul on the road to Damascus, 
Eddie's life was completely changed by a vision of the divine. In his case, it was the great spirit, a manifestation of his people's connection to the land. And like Saul, who became an apostle named Paul, Eddie became a guide for the First Nations people, spreading the transformative power of the vision quest. What happens when someone sees or feels what they believe is the presence of God? The simple answer is perspective. It's a moment of understanding. It shows a way forward. Visions happen in the mind of one person. But when someone like St. Bernadette, Charles Mully, Eddie Robinson, have the courage to share their vision, they can alter the course of many lives, even change the world.